Yes. Good morning. Hey, thank you very much for coming this morning. Um, my name is Bill Malik. Um, I'm one of the senior people in Trend. I've been here for almost two years. Uh, but on the other hand, I've been in IT for 45 years and uh, learned something new every week. Hopefully, there'll be something here that you'll say, gee, I didn't know that. That's cool. And that's what we're doing. Trend's moving into um, IoT in a huge way. Um, I'm having conversations with Terrence Liu now pretty much every week about what's going on with TX1. We have a couple of announcements that will be coming later in this year that will strengthen our presence in Industry 4.0 Advanced Manufacturing and that will enhance what we're doing with automotive and that will strengthen what we're doing with uh, power systems. So uh, this is, uh, trend is in with both feet going for a long way. Now this presentation, um, and we've got an hour, but I have no intention of filling all of it, so there'll be plenty of time for questions. And if there's something that's really preg uh, you know, imponderable on the screen, interrupt me. I mean, one of the plagues of our industry is the proliferation of acronyms, and industrial control systems have their own. And IED, if you're where I come from, is something you try to avoid on the road in Baghdad. An IED in industrial control systems is an intelligent electronic device. Right? And that's just one example of the dozens of conflicts of meaning. And not only do we have conflicts of language, we have conflicts of architecture. And that's some of the thing we'll see at the end. So the structure of the presentation is uh, the first handful of slides are going to be about satellites because satellites are cool. Uh, then we're going to take a drill down on the Hubble to see what kind of systems are in place to support it. And then we'll take a look at vulnerabilities in satellites, and then we'll get to the big finish and the surprise, sorry for the spoiler, satellites are just IoT devices. Okay. They live in a different environment, but they're hard to reach, they've got limited resources, they're vulnerable to attack, they don't follow standard communications protocols, just like every other ICT on the planet. So once you get past the cool stuff about satellites, there are some lessons that can be applied right down here right in your home with Alexa. Uh, I do have a set of references at the end of the deck also. So it's a page of the papers that get behind some of the stuff. So, uh, so let's begin looking at, now this moves slowly because these are large charts. Well, I should be pointing it at this one, shouldn't I? Yes. Okay. There we go. Okay, satellites. Uh, so, first satellite, for those of you who weren't there, uh, Sputnik, uh, I was five years old. Um, what did it teach us? It told us, first of all, you could establish and maintain a stable orbit. That thing was up there broadcasting for about, I think, three weeks. It lasted about three months, then it fell back to the Earth. It carried its own power. It was actually pressurized inside. And so, um, they had to take uh, notice of what the temperature was and what the pressure was, and the noise you heard from Sputnik. If you had a ham radio set, we're listening, go beep, 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 what that was, it was telling you with the tone and the frequency of the tones, the um, pressure and the temperature inside the satellite. That was all it was doing, just saying, I'm here, it's warm, you know, pressure's coming down, and so on. That was the first thing. It was a Soviet, so it really spurred the US into action. Echo One came a few years later. This was our first communication satellite. Uh, it's a hundred foot diameter, 30 meter diameter. Boom, there's no, no operational parts other than there's a powder inside of it and the powder sublimates and that maintains the pressure about one pound per square inch inside. It was up there for a number of months until the solar winds blew it into the atmosphere. That was when we learned there was such a thing as solar wind. So it was allergy, you got to take advantage of you know, solar wind. So we'll put up communication satellite. Here's Telstar. Telstar was uh, the satellite responsible for the first telephone communication through space. It was a call actually from London to Washington. Um, got a significant amount of press at the time. What you see here are in the center a row of kind of elliptical, but, but square in section. Um, transmission and reception antennas and the black panels are solar cells. That's how it um, kept itself. This one I think is actually still up there, although it died decades ago, still in order. Um, Skylab was a place where people, the interesting thing you learned about this is 
solar wind the bad outlet radiation belts uh, knocked it uh, out for a while uh, you'll notice there's a certain asymmetry here the panel on the right is a fully deployed solar panel what you don't see on the left is its mate which didn't come out we learned that these things are vulnerable we also learned that you can vary the amount of power by changing the angle on the solar panels if you put a square onto the sun you get a lot of power if you're almost full you want to tilt the things down so we learned about manipulating the environment. We also learned about having people up there. There were people that lived in there for um, 54 days. Uh, it, uh, it came down uh, a couple of years later, memorable performance by John Belushi on Saturday Night Live about here comes Skylab. You know, the thing fell out of the sky. Uh, at this point, there were very few satellites up there. Everyone was new, it was all exciting. People were trying to figure out what frequencies could be transmitted information on. Uh, the, lower the satellite, the closer to the Earth, that is, the faster it has to move, which means if you're in a low Earth orbit, then you're going to be visible for about five minutes out of each orbit, and an orbit can take an hour and a half. So if you want to maintain communications through a network of satellites, you need a constellation of them. Uh, we'll get into some orbit uh, characteristics uh, later. Um, and then, Voyager. Uh, this is my favorite, although it doesn't really belong here because it's not a satellite, <coughs> because it's not orbiting anything. Uh, Voyager is now 13 billion miles away. It's about 21 billion kilometers. Um, it's got a 200 watt battery. This thing on the end of the post on the bottom, that conical thing, is a, a reservoir of uh, plutonium through... Uh, Radioactive decay, it generates heat. There's a thermocouple that turns the heat into power. When it launched, it had 420 watts. It's got about 200 left. Um, last year, they fired up the engines to try to orient it. They had been in cold soak, that means a couple of degrees above absolute zero. For 17 years, they lit up just fine. So this thing's going to be in service for another five to 10 years. The communications with this are not secure. First of all, it doesn't have a lot of processing power. There are three processors on here that have an aggregate capacity of about 140 kips. A kip is one thousandth of a MIP. So this is a 0 0.14 MIPS complex of processors. It has about a quarter meg of storage. And if you want to set up an SSL link, the handshake is going to take six days because it takes 20 hours for an EM signal to get to the satellite and 20 hours to get back. So this is uh, the most remote ICT device uh, in the known universe. Uh, what we've learned from these things is you can do stuff up there. You can do interesting stuff. You can set up communication links with a network of these low Earth orbit satellites. Telstra was one of a series, and right now we've got Iridium, one of the Iridium satellites which is for telecommunications plays in an interesting scenario um, that I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, the uh, middle Earth orbit uh, has a slower transit time, it's higher up, uh, and so it's able to do station keeping. The orbit's going to be uh, a few hours, and so it appears to move much more slowly. Um, geosynchronous orbits, these are satellites that are 22,000 miles up. And because their orbital period is 24 hours, they look like they're not moving, right? So the satellite appears to be the same place in the sky. Uh, there are now dozens of geosynchronous satellites occupying this band over the uh, equator. Uh, the higher orbit the satellites are extremely eccentric in orbit. They get as low as a couple hundred miles and then go out uh, 10,000 miles or further. These are 22,000 miles. The advantage with a higher orbit satellite is you can go way out beyond the interference and take pictures and then come back and have high bandwidth uh, communications with the ground station. The replacement for the Hubble, the WIP, will be in uh, a, an extremely high Earth orbit. It'll be about a million miles away, so we'll be beyond the moon, uh, looking at uh, stars and telling us what the universe looks like from even farther away. So let's take a look at Hubble because there's a lot we can learn about satellites from it. This is the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, the door here is to protect the optics from what we, mostly, basically, mostly, <laughs> that's, uh, there. mostly protected from sunlight. 
It's got two high gain antennas. These guys at the ends of the stalks. The stalks are about uh, three meters long. And it's got two low gain antennas. The image is clipped, but these little things that look like styrofoam cups. Those are broadband, less capacity. The Hubble orbits around 320 miles off, which means that its uh, orbital um, period is a couple hours. So it's going to be moving in different parts of the sky while it's maintaining position. And it maintains position in a rather ingenious fashion. It doesn't have any jets on it. You wouldn't want those. Because if you run a jet, you're generating exhaust, which would form a cloud around the Hubble, which would block its vision. So the way the Hubble steers is they have big gyroscopes. They speed them up with solar power converted to electricity. And then when they want to turn the Hubble that way, what they try to do is get the gyroscope spinning really fast and move it the other way. If you've ever held a bicycle wheel and somebody spins it really fast to try to tip it, you notice that it reacts. That's what these things are. They're reaction generators. That's how you aim the Hubble without putting any dirt into the air around it. The Hubble doesn't work by itself. This is the Hubble whoops, um, support system. Right, there it is. So there's the Hubble 320 miles up, taking a look at something far away. It uses its broadband antenna, the high gain antenna, to transmit information up to a geosynchronous satellite called a tracking and data relay satellite. Now, these guys are space jocks, which are very close to IT people. So if you don't think that they refer to that as the TARDIS, you're wrong. Um, these things are geosync. There's uh, nine of them. They aggregate the data from Hubble, and then they send it to the ground station over which they're stationed. Here. The ground station then sends the information back to the flight center, which transfers it to the state, the Space Telescope Science Institute, where they interpret the image. If you want to point the Hubble somewhere else, you get in a queue and talk to somebody at STSI. They then send the um, commands to the Goddard Space Flight Center, which transmits it to the appropriate ground station. There are four now. And those ground stations will then send it up to the appropriate TARDIS, which will then tell the Hubble where to point next. Very complex infrastructure. And these use different frequencies. This is a terrestrial uh, internet-based connectivity. Uh, there are different frequencies. Uh, up and down links, different frequencies for data and for commands. Uh, and the whole thing is actually quite elaborate. And that leads us uh, to, uh, this is the space network. There are nine of these satellites. This shows their relative position. There are now four ground stations. There's one in Guam, there's one in New Mexico, and there are now two in Baltimore, Maryland that uh, aggregate the information from the satellites. Um, the TARDIS is a complex piece itself. Multiple bands, multiple antennas, uh, uh, flexible, aimable solar panels to keep the, so this is the third generation of these things. A tremendous amount of capacity, a lot of networking. Um, think about satellites that do things like transmit uh, satellite TV, right? There's data bandwidth, which is the uplink from the ground station to satellite, and then it's downlink to wherever you are. And then there's a separate control network, which tells the satellite where to point. People can attack these things by jamming the signal. They can attack them by uh, taking over uh, the command streams, causing the satellite to move. Uh, you can cause the satellite damage by steering it into another satellite. You can cause the satellite damage by pointing the solar panels square out at the sun and overcharging the batteries and burning it out, which gets us into the vulnerabilities. Are, are we good so far? Kind of a lot of science work the first thing in the morning, but we'll, we'll get to the real stuff soon. So what do we use satellites for? Communications um, for beaconing. Satellites tell us time. Satellites tell us uh, location. They can talk about what's going on with weather. Weather forecasting is extremely important. Um, health of crops, uh, where, where large fires are burning. Um, they explore space. They tell us what's going on out there. Uh, and they communicate among themselves back to Earth. Sometimes they're used as channels for telephones, satellite phone. Right? Um, the original theory behind satellites for communication was that these things were bent pipes, meaning you sent up a signal and it just boosted it and sent it back out. No processing, no analysis, no examination of the content whatsoever. 
separate band. It's just a big mirror. It's not much far above echo one. Um, this leads to a host of uh, vulnerabilities. This is the schematic for what's going on on a data satellite that has both data uplinks and downlinks and telemetry and communications tracking uplinks and downlinks. The vulnerable areas are shown in black and in gray. Okay. Everything <laughs> is, is, is wide open. Um, there were um, a series of problems with satellites. And in 2002, uh, the US uh, uh, Government Accountability Office, the GAO, published a report on satellite problems. This was the first slide in that report. Uh, these are the unintentional threats to satellites. Here are the things that get wrong. That are, that are unintentional. You can have a problem at the ground station. You can have uh, solar wind, you can have meteorites, you can have space debris, or you can have solar activity disrupting the traffic. Unintentional human interface. Somebody's got a, a transmitter that they're sending on the wrong uh, frequency. Uh, these, this is my brain, so I always do one of these before I talk. Never look at it, but I always have. Um, You'll notice among the unintentional threats, there's no mention made of dumb design or of software code defects. And that's the first important lesson out of this. People in ICT don't think about programming defects. And this is pervasive across the ICT world. And the way they address it is not by suddenly getting smarter the way they address it is by guaranteeing from an engineering perspective that when the thing fails, it fails safely. The overriding mantra for all forms of engineering is safety. When the thing breaks, it's got to break in a manner that isn't going to put human lives at risk, and to the extent possible, not going to put property at risk. To give a very terrestrial example, if you have an automated escalator and it breaks, you would like it to break in a fashion that doesn't cause people to go tumbling all over the place. And you'd like it to break in a fashion that even if it's not moving, it still use it like stairs. That's good engineering design. Those are explicit design decisions you make when you're building an estimate. This is a picture, a scientist, an astrophysicist from the mid seventies named Kessler said, we're putting a lot of stuff in low earth orbit. Right now there are 26,000 man-made objects in orbit. You can go to um, Socrates.org and it will tell you where these things are and which ones are likely to run into each other. Kessler's concern was that once you get beyond a certain number of these things, you have a risk that if there is a problem with a satellite, it could hit another satellite and the resulting collision could cause thousands of pieces of debris, which will then hit other satellites, which will cause more problems. You have a cascading chain reaction, if you will, of satellite collisions um, at 150 to 250 miles up in low Earth orbit. Um, the recent Chinese demonstration that they could take out a satellite created 2,000 pieces of debris over a centimeter in size. As a result of that, the International Space Station had to go 50 miles higher in order to avoid the debris cloud from that recent incident. It's not the first time it's happened. The intentional threats to satellites include physical destruction of the ground station, sabotaging anything, an interceptor, a pulse laser, um, cyber attacks. Again, these are things that people would do to a satellite that have done to satellites jamming the signals. Um, but again, what's not shown here are code bugs. And that's the other side of the vulnerability. <laughs> I gave an early version of this pitch at RSA uh, in the first week of uh, March. And I found out that there are counters in some of the older GPS satellites that tick off the weeks since the beginning of time. The beginning of time, as we all know, is January 1, 1980. The counter, which counts down the weeks, is 10 bits long. Now, class, let's stop and do some arithmetic. <laughs> there are 52 weeks in a year. You've got a 10-bit counter, which goes to 1,023. 
which says that within 20 years, the counter rolls over. It did in 1999. It did again on uh, Saturday, the 6th of April. And on Saturday, the 6th of April, about 15787s in China and a KLM flight to, um, I think it was Latin America, were grounded because a pilot looked at his instruments and he noted, oh, okay, so uh, the heading is this and the altitude is that and the date is August 22nd, 1999. <laughs> Troubling. If you're a pilot and the date says it's uh, 20 years ago, you have to ask yourself, I wonder if any of the other instruments are lying to you. <laughs> Honeywell was unable to certify the aircraft as airworthy because they didn't know why this thing was given the wrong date. And so 15 flights were grounded in China, some were grounded in Schiphol. It was the 787s and the 777s. Boeing's own satellite system had this defect. They've since remediated. Newer satellites have a 13-bit counter, which means we have 157 years before it rolls over. But among the other problems, New York City spent half a billion dollars in 2008 and 2009 creating a citywide wireless network called NYC Win. The NYC Win network, maintained by Lockheed Martin, crashed one minute before 8 p.m. That's Eastern time, which is midnight here, on April 6th was down for 10 days. The automated traffic signals reverted to regular timer mode. The police could not upload videos of traffic accidents. People could not use the wireless service for the city of New York. This is going to find its way into my Smart Cities talk, which I'll be delivering here first week of June at the okay. This is a design defect. It is not something an industrial engineer would think of. It's like building the bridge with the wrong beams. Why would you put something that's got a 20 to 50 year life up there with a counter that only goes to 20 years? It's done in retrospect. But the specification was inaccurate. The other problem, which relates to uh, Kessler syndrome, uh, had to do with uh, precision. The uh, Socrates system predicted 10 years ago uh, that two satellites were going to pass 564 meters apart. One of the satellites was a 1990s, uh, 1980s vintage Soviet communications satellite. It was defunct. It was just forming. The other one was number 33 of the Iridium constellation. They didn't pass within 564 meters. They collided and the resulting cloud of debris caused another couple thousand pieces of trash to get sent into orbit as well. Now, this is a software bug for two, one of two reasons. I don't know which. I haven't seen any after action. I haven't seen any lessons learned. But the first one has to do with precision. If I tell you I'm going to be somewhere 564 meters away from something, then you're probably going to assume that I'm going to be between 563 and a half and 564 and a half meters from whatever that thing is. So either the system invented precision, right? The original sensors that read the precision did not have three digits of accuracy. And all they should have said is they'll be within a kilometer. Good luck. Keep an eye on this. Or they actually performed the calculation wrong. They had good data, they were tracking the orbit right, but when they did the arithmetic, they messed up. In either case, it's a software coding defect, either a mathematical error or an error in the UI. You cannot invent precision. You can't invent precision. Just because you can perform the calculation doesn't mean you automatically have three digits of accuracy. So those are the two kinds of programming problems that will screw up industrial control systems. And there's a third one, which I don't have a chart on yet because I just learned about it last week. Sensors provide a whiteboard. I have. I have. A blue pen with the answers in it. This is not for me. This is for everything. <coughs> Thank you. 
here's, here's what a sensor is going to tell you. The first thing we do in IoT is we convert that to a digital signal. So what does the digital signal say? What did we lose? We lost the evidence that the sensor is actually working. Triton interrupts this process. The Triton malware replaces the actual signal, which represents the actual state of the sensor, with a canned signal that says, everything's fine, boss. And because all the safety systems and all the telemetry and all the control systems use the digital output of the sensor, none of them were able to say that what was really happening was this. that it was too hot. Triton killed the safety systems. And it did it in June of last year. Caused the plant to crash. The refinery in Saudi Arabia sent the module back to Schneider and said, what's wrong with this stuff? And Schneider took a close look at the module and said, it's fine. There's some corrosion on one of the contacts, but the module is fine. The software is good. Why? Because the malware was in the network. It wasn't in the sensor. It wasn't in the server. It was interrupting the traffic and replacing it with, yeah, we're a little warm up, we're a little cool, everything's cool, we're a little warm, it's getting better. The plant went down again, two months later, and that was when they finally decided to do some forensic analysis on the network and discovered that there had been malware in that plant for over a year. And since then, we found that Triton has infected at least two other petrochemical facilities. Not sure where. So we've just had a peek ahead at what's going to be in the Safe Cities talk. So the types of things that can, people can do to sell it, are there any questions on that? Um, can we build it? Do we understand what their end game is? Why they wanted to do that? They wanted to cause the plant to destroy itself to kill people. Suspicion it's uh, Iranian hackers. Sorry? Like Stuxnet. Except Stuxnet just wanted to destroy the centrifuges. This thing wanted to, uh, the specific control systems where I can't remember the chemical, but it's nasty, it's lethal, and it's a gas and it would have rendered the facility uh, unusable for weeks while it was being cleaned up. So the kinds of problems that can... Uh, okay. Uh, so the kinds of problems that can happen to satellites are jamming, which means blocking the communications transfer. This is interrupting your uh, satellite phone. This is interrupting your download of airplanes. Uh, eavesdropping, meaning I can hear what's going on in your satellite. Again, where there's no processing, no encryption or decryption. If you want the signal to be safe and secure, you have to encrypt it. Um, I actually got into a conversation with one of our researchers about this point. If I call you on a landline, that conversation has a presumption of privacy because I have to do something overt to tap that line. If I call you on a cell phone, there is no presumption of privacy because it's a broadcast signal and anybody can stick an antenna up there and read it. The very early generations of cell phones were not encrypted. And so if you could listen, you could hear what people were saying. It's really quickly adopted encryption technology and frequency hopping um, to, to uh, preserve this. But you have to take over steps to uh, secure the traffic we can hijack. In this, in this case, again, here's where the language doesn't quite match what we think of a hijack. When a satellite person is talking about a hijack, they mean taking over the traffic, right? So that guy in Florida in the 1990s who hijacked his digital TV signal and put some softcore porn out there, uh, that was a, a hijack. And then there's a control takeover, which is you actually 
direct the satellite to do something that its manufacturer operator is not intended uh, to do. Um, in the late 90s, there were a series of problems that led to the GAO report. Uh, following that GAO report, NASA delivered a report to Congress that looked at intrusions from 1998 to 2014. Most of them were ground-based intrusions. Somebody you know, got fished and they let somebody in. Some of them were non-trivial. I mean, design specs for future generation satellites were lost. These specifically happened to um, satellites in space. In 98, a jointly operated satellite was uh, blinded. Somebody took over the control, aimed the silver panels at the sun, the batteries were fried, the satellite died. In 2007 and 8, Landsat 7 was taken over and relocated. You know, after much scurrying around, they were able to capture it back. 2008, Terra, the uh, EOS, Earth Orbiting uh, Satellite System, were taken over twice. This is NASA stuff. This is just NASA. In 2008, a Trojan hit the ISS as they're running <clears throat> Windows 98. <laughs> and some guy brought a USB stick up because he wanted to bring some pictures down to his kids and don't you know, they weren't running heat security. So uh, the ISS got, uh, got uh, infected. This is just NASA systems. In addition, in February of 99, this actually made the press and was really an interesting story. Um, the British has a set of military satellites called Skynet. Yes, Cardus Skynet. Great, that was the name for my whole Wi Fi access point, two to one. Uh, hackers took over one of the then four satellites, moved it, and demanded ransom. Now, if you look, and I have the press references in the, uh, in the notes at the end. Uh, it was very interesting. It said the satellite was moved, and amateur astronomers said, "Yeah, the satellite moved." Um, and then there was a rumor that somebody had asked for ransom, and then all of a sudden, a whole bunch of stories. No, it didn't move. We never lost control of it. And the Guardian said, "We were wrong. Gosh, you know, bad on us." A colleague of mine at Gartner was attending the Naval War College in Rhode Island, and he happened to run into uh, a British um, uh, spy who was lecturing him. And this was in the summer of 99. And he said, what happened? And the guy said, over a cup of coffee, well, they, uh, they moved the satellite, they sent us a ransom note. And he says, yeah, what happened? He said, well, we found out who they were. My friend said, well, what happened? They went away. <laughs> no ransom was paid. Um, you don't, you don't mess with the um, conversion. And in 2000, the French took over a GPS and they caused some tanks to get lost. <laughs> Just, you know, intramural fun between friendly agencies. But uh, Abrams and British Shallow tanks were driving into the swamps and such. Um, more recently, we've seen beaconing attacks um, in the uh, Caspian Sea. So, what do we do about it? Well, you can take care of jamming by using spread spectrum technology. You can't jam all the all frequencies, all the signals. Uh, you can harden the satellites against uh, electromagnetic pulse. Um, you can use authentication GPS. Current generation of GPS actually provide a key that you can, if you've got the horsepower, uh, use to verify that it is a true GPS signal. These are threat-specific actions. These are things that you take if you know they're coming after you right here. This is like adding a rule to a fire, right? Um, they're not systemic responses. Here are systemic responses. You need security orchestration because the speed with which these things happen is too fast for people to react to. Uh, you heard of the problem at uh, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, TMSC. They've got an automated factory in Taiwan that builds ships. It has 100,000 robotic assembly devices. It's walled off. It's in its own separate universe. It doesn't talk to anything. Well, don't you know, a tech wandered into there and plugged his laptop into the devices to download some data, uploaded a virus. 
It spread across the entire plant. 100,000 machines were infected in 40 seconds. It was like, uh oh. If they had segmented that environment into, say, 200 pieces, they would have lost 500 machines, but not 100,000 machines. Network segmentation is crucial. Why did this happen? Because the machines were running an embedded Windows 7 system. Why the hell would you run Windows 7 and not update it? Because if you tamper with the software, you invalidate the warranty and you lose service. Same thing with medical devices in the US. The FDA guarantees a hospital that it's secure, they check it, if you mess with the software, you lose your certification. So the way they kept those pristine Windows 7 driven 100,000 machines safe was they didn't allow anybody to connect to them. Now they're running Windows 7, but they don't have a whole heck of a lot of horsepower. And if you think the problem has gone away, um, I retweeted a piece I saw from, well, I'll get you the reference, it's on my William Malik TM Twitter account, showing that the current generation of Hyundai devices is running Windows CE, and if you put a USB into the port with a file called hyundaiupdate.exe, it will run it. <laughs> it's like IIS comes out as you know, no optional extra. Right? So you need to apply the fundamentals of what we know are good security practices. ISO 7498 is the OSI reference file. Right? So reference file. 7498 2 look at these five core security functions and say, where do we apply them on layers one through seven? And how do we do that? Now the good news is that the industrial control system people recognize the problem and they've created a parallel standard called 62443, uh, there's references in there, that applies the same things and includes the safety and um, availability, by that they mean service ability, uh, into security programs that still the Cyber safety concept is brand new. Uh, I was at the uh, Industrial Control System Working Group meeting in Kansas City uh, two weeks ago and learned about a group that is going to start looking for security metrics in Internet of Things. I nominated myself to be a member of that team. There are about 70 other people who want to be part of it, so we'll see how that works. Uh, do more monitoring and logging. And here is where I put in bold type the note keep a, a record of the original unaltered traffic from the sensor. And when you hear a number like, gee, there's gonna be 20 billion IoT sensors out there by next year, you know, how, how can that happen? Well, one of the things I learned was a 150 megawatt solar field as an array of panels generating 150 megawatts has one million panels. Each panel has an inverter and a sensor. And they're both transmitting information constantly. And each 16 panels has a PLC, a programmable logic controller. So you got 2 million end devices and 62,500 PLCs. And that's one plant. That's one couple acre field out there in the countryside soaking up sunlight. So that's how you get to a couple dozens of billions fairly quickly. The rate at which things are going out is astonishing. The New York City um, wireless network has almost 400 access points in the city. There are 12,000 traffic lights being monitored and connected to this thing. So these things, when they decide to say go, they scale up real fast. The new bridge that connects uh, Westchester County with uh, Rockland and Orange Counties, the Mario Cuomo thing, replaced the Tappan Zee. Gorgeous bridge, designed for a hundred year lifespan. It has over 5,000 IoT sensors embedded in the bridge to take a look at traffic, to take a look at weight distribution, to take a look at wind, to take a look at rain, to take a look at temperature. And it is constantly broadcasting. And of course, there are a couple dozen cameras that you can dial into. Now the cameras are HD, but when a civilian looks at them, they de-res the thing. So you can't see the license plates clearly. But for public safety, they've got extremely high capacity stuff. And London is no stranger to cameras. Okay. 
So we've got an awful lot of information coming up fast. And this raises the point about satellite and 5G. 5G is going to do two things which scare the life out of me. The first is you're going to have a blue million of these things. There are going to be so many devices all over the place. And as you go from place to place, you're going to be connecting from one to the other. But it's not like a cell phone today where it's a pretty much electromechanical infrastructure you're talking to. When you connect to 5G, they're building an entire stack. They're building a series of virtual environments that are linked to give you the set of services you want, which aren't going to be the same set of services that you want or that you want or that I'm using. And when we traverse from one cell to another, they tear down and rebuild that stuff in each one of those. So we're talking about multiple layers of virtualization on top of huge volumes of traffic. So I don't know if satellites are going to help. Again, class, let's go to physics. The speed of light is 186 miles in a millisecond. 186 miles is about the lowest the low Earth orbit can get you. And so right there, the traffic up, you've broken the threshold of response time that a 5G network needs. The backhaul on 5G is going to use the internet because they don't have the capacity in the system for to networks to handle it. So you've got all of this traffic coming up, which means satellites may not help because they're too far away, but the demand for edge devices, which can aggregate that data and then pipe it off to this dynamic stack that's being created and torn down every minute right, as you drive along, uh, drive along the motorway. That extremely volatile environment, that huge data intensive environment, that incredibly dynamic environment is going to be very, very difficult to secure systematically. So 5G, not happening this year, even though my phone says it's 5G ready, which is nonsense. May happen in a couple of years, but it's going to be a big challenge for us. And that's why hybrid cloud is a huge important strategy. When 5G happens, however it happens, there are going to be a boatload of security issues that we're going to have to uh, step up to. So long-term solutions, satellites, just another IoT device, another function. Use comprehensive security, design it in from the top, um, and consider your architecture as OT risks. That bottom line is what industrial control systems people just don't think about. Um, one more, I believe. Yeah, references. Um, this is the initial BBC report about the uh, uh, satellite being hacked. Uh, this is the report that uh, came out of a uh, lab on the US West Coast. Uh, this, <laughs> when I was in uh, the RSA conference, I said, as an aside, I don't think I'm going to fly on Saturday the 6th because of this 10 bit YTP like thing. There were 70 people in the room, and one of them was a reporter. So we got, by the time I got off the plane in uh, New York, uh, there were about 45 news outlets carrying the story. I was interviewed by the Boston Globe, I was interviewed by NPR uh, to say, no, 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 it's not the end of the world. Uh, it turned out that there were some problems. The, Follow-up story was titled, The Planes Didn't Fall Out of the Sky, but Some of Them Didn't Get Into the Sky. Uh, and there are other things, uh, the notes section of this, and you have a copy of this presentation. And that's, that's the material. Any other, uh, any questions? Additional. 